the picture uh, of uh, what we are doing. So we are starting chapter 9 now. I have an overview of convolutional networks and this is a very basic uh, set of slides on what is the convolution operation, it's a standard mathematical operation. And again, why I already mentioned to mention it to you. And then the idea of pooling is uh, it's about half the number of slides. I have another whole section which is actually it needs more than one lecture to cover all the other parts. The very last part of it is uh, is um, convolutional or uh, is is capsule networks. Okay, so let us uh, do a little bit of. Uh, um, convolutional neural networks overview. I mentioned to you uh, the motivation and all that. So just, just let's just look at the slides. All right, these are the tremendous range of topics here: the convolutional operation, motivation, pooling, convolution and pooling as an infinitely strong prior. Well. After the fact, people are trying to now say this is another kind of prior uh, which is uh, necessary for generalization and then uh, variant structured outputs, data types, efficient convolution algorithms, so on, the, the neuroscientific basis for convolutional networks and uh, convolutional networks in the history of deep learning. So there is all this plus more stuff that is being generated uh, now by, by researchers. So all of this is happening. All right. So we have an overview, traditional versus convolutional networks. Yeah, this overview slide here simply says convolutional networks uh, are applied to a grid-like topology, uh, like an image data. Grid-like topology could also be a speech signals or it could be an image uh, signal, uh, which are 2D grid of pixels. And they utilize convolution, which is a kind of a specialized linear operation. Just like RNNs are also for grid-like structure on time, this is spatial or one-dimensional, which is time. And uh, something to keep in mind is in all of these uh, uh, neural networks, deep networks, we go from one level to the next level. In this case, there are three levels here, inputs, hidden, and output. And when we show all these uh, connections here, saying there are values interacting with all of these, that's a matrix multiplication. A matrix multiplies the input vector to give us this vector and that vector is multiplied by another matrix to give us this vector. So these are a sequence of uh, matrix multiplications and we can think about what exactly are these matrix multiplications. There is also activation coming into play. After we do the matrix multiplication, uh, there is a bias term and then we do a, a nonlinear term H applied to it to give us Z or Z. X becomes a Z and Z becomes a Y here. And those are the x and uh, these values, and it kind of shows you what kind of matrix multiplications exist. Uh, this is a nice uh, diagram that shows you exactly what the calculations are. And in the case of uh, two-dimensional convolution, we take uh, there is an input. It's a, it's a three by four, three rows and four columns is the input. We are multiplying it by a kernel, which is two by two. So we place that W, X, Y, Z, that's the kernel, and then we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, that's the input. And we are moving the kernel left to right, and every time we place the kernel on it, we multiply the corresponding items, A, W plus B, X plus E, Y plus F, Z, and then we move it to the next one and the next one. Of course, it's something, it's got a term called stride. Is you move by one or do you move by two, that kind of thing, that's the size of stride. And so you go left to right, top to bottom, and uh, so this says uh, you are going to be able to creating uh, creating a new matrix now. I mean, a new new uh, input, uh, new uh, one from one layer from the input. You are going to the next level of the representation of the input, and the number of elements needed uh, to produce that are only four. So the fewer weights are needed than for full matrix multiplication. And here's one more picture. Here, this one shows a a color image. We got a, a red, uh, green, and blue RGB three color channels. An image, color image will have three basic channels in it, and these are all the values in among these three color channels. And this particular image is just uh, four by four by four image, and those are the input image values. So we are now passing along uh, a a convolution, a kernel of this sort one zero one zero one zero one zero one that is being processed over all of these and one particular layer here 
Okay, I guess this is a different image now. We are processing this image with that kernel, and it's computing a convolved feature that is multiplying the corresponding elements, adding them, and so on. It's kind of tries to illustrate that point here. And this is an interesting uh, diagram I found, which is uh, the movement of the kernel. You can think of it as a uh, depth. So this image now has a depth of three. And so this uh, convolution that's happening is actually a cube of some sort here. It's being moved left to right, top to bottom like that. And that's the movement of the kernel. So this is basically the kind of operation that's going on. Keeping, hmm? what's that? Oh, of the kernel, yeah. How do you decide the elements of the kernel? Um, so we'll see some examples here that uh, something like that with probably an edge detection kernel, which is kind of finding the edges. Uh, and uh, you will see in some of these architectures, several kernels being used. So one of which could be oriented towards uh, edges. Uh, and uh, some other kernels can be doing some other operation, blurring or something like that. So you might have different kernels playing a role in all of these. And then you got to be keeping track of uh, each of the uh, color layers as well, right? So we'll look at that a little bit more in terms of um, the choice of kernels and how many kernels do they use? Yeah. Not necessarily. See, this is uh, your free to choose them however you want, right? It's uh, you have to specify now this cube here. So uh, you might, uh, you may or you may not want to use the same form of it, you know. So there's a flexibility there that's going on, right? Here is a here is a nice architecture I saw, which is for a convolutional neural network. Um, so what is a CNN convolutional neural network? is a neural network that uses convolution in place of general matrix multiplication in at least one of the layers. I says, here is an architecture where somewhere you're using convolutional layer. Let me say the whole thing is a convolutional neural network. All right, that's how it was defined. Maybe, maybe uh, you know, today with so many uh, architectures that might, uh, it might involve CNN, RNN, everything. So then is it still call it a CNN? Okay, it's using a convolutional neural network. Uh, con a convolutional layer, it's a convolution neural network. Convolution can be used as multiplication by matrix. Here is here is something current. Okay, looks this, this looks like an image of a car. I suppose this is the this is the design for uh, an auto a, a self-driving car. And the three layers here, he's got an image here that's looking at this uh, at the scene outside, producing a color image. And uh, what is our goal here is. Uh, I guess this is saying it's a car or a truck or a van or a bicycle. All right. So uh, anyway, a made up type of thing. Maybe, maybe the car needs to know what kind of a vehicle, right? Yeah, I guess we should add auto rickshaw is an important thing in, in, in Bangalore. <laughs> right? I think I told you my, my basic rules of driving is that don't look at the auto rickshaw driver's eye. Otherwise, you'll think you're weak, right? So <laughs> anyway, so if you want to have a self-aware car, uh, it needs to have an auto rickshaw as one of the one of the outputs over here, and then decides where to look. All right, now, uh, so what's happening here? We have an input, and then there is a convolutional layer here. I guess they show it as a bit of thickness here with that cube and so on, and then they are applying a ReLU operation as the uh, activation function. So we are converting this uh, thick layer into this thick layer. It's shown a little bit smaller because you lose some information when you apply the convolution operation. And then we reduce this whole thing into a smaller one by, for example, all of that gets the smaller one using uh, the a pooling operation. This seems to be the standard thing. You do a convolution, pooling, convolution, pooling. This one happens to have only two of these. This seems to go together, convolution, relu, pooling. This is convolution, relu, pooling again here. And then there is uh, the actual classification. So you now have that car being represented in some way by a small number of values being flattened out into a vector. We refer to this as a fully connected uh, layer. So this is being uh, mapped uh, into uh, the final classification using, okay, this one fully connected. Yeah, there's a hidden layer, from the input hidden layer to the output. And the output has all of these values. And we use the standard softmax 
which is a generalization of a two class classifier into a multi class classifier where all the uh, all the probabilities uh, add up to one it's a very interesting simple conversion that goes on so this seems to be a very classic architecture of uh, performing of using convolutional neural networks to perform uh, a, a simple classification uh, I've given you know, there are all kinds of beautiful blogs now nowadays to read all of this stuff uh, so that's what i'm trying to do to read the blogs myself uh, because you you know the older book type of descriptions get a little outdated and they're not rich enough to capture all the things going on so that's that uh, i'm also trying to uh, add as i move along uh, what does the code look like right uh, i'm finding this keras to be nice uh, i think you're all using uh, pytorch rather than keras but Anyway, this, they are they they are all hopefully similar, and uh, this is a Google TensorFlow people. That, that's that's where the uh, that's where uh, uh, Keras comes into play. Just looking to see how popular is is, is uh, Keras. You know, uh, what I could find was it was a couple of years old. It said uh, two hundred thousand people are using using Keras. And, uh, um, I don't know where it stands right now. You know, which is the which is the most popular. Uh, uh popular deep learning uh, environment um you know maybe pytorch people say pytorch is easier to use and uh, keras is supposed to be easier to use than, than tensorflow and there's a library on top of it but anyway uh each of these has a particular syntax convolutional uh, 1d keras dot layers convolution diff so you need to specify a bunch of arguments like filters kernel size strides padding data format so we'll look at what those things mean uh, you can have one dimensional convolution or you can have two dimensional convolution in which case you have strides one one which means you have stride along the x axis stride along the y axis uh, and so on and what are all these uh, uh, all these uh, arguments and these are definitions like filters kernel size and strides and padding data format all these kinds of things you can find online on um, uh, on defining a convolutional layer Okay, this slide uh, simply says uh, that convolutional layers, uh, this is about runtime of traditional versus convolutional networks. And uh, in a traditional uh, network, uh, any given value in the input, like, like let's say the gray one at the lower level, is influencing every one at the output level. So that is the kind of influence you know every input pixel has on all at the next layer if you had a full matrix multiplication that's a tremendous amount of influence one one element has whereas in a convolutional network there's a sparse interaction that this is now influencing only this small number all right and uh, one can argue in terms of uh, what is the computation involved in all of these with m inputs and n outputs matrix multiplication requires m times n parameters and order m times n uh, runtime, for example. This means uh, every output unit interacts with every input unit between the two layers, that is. If we limit a uh, number of connections for each input to k, we need k by n parameters and, uh, and order k by n instead of m by n, it is uh, k, by, k by n. So, so this is, uh, you know, depends on the size of this. Uh, of this uh, of this kernel you're choosing k for kernel i suppose so that is uh, one issue and uh, okay so what are, what are all the topics here in in convolutional neural networks what convolution is motivation pooling and uh, i guess we've talked about all of these even more efficient making it even more efficient standard example of neuros okay that's uh, i think convolution neural networks stand out as an example of uh, neuroscientific principles uh, in deep learning and there are very deep convolutional network architectures right so that is the constant constant theme is the neuroscientific principles that play a role so we are not, not just talking about functions from a mathematical point of view we're always there in terms of you know what is the computation needed for it but uh, but we're also taking inspiration that uh, intelligence is uh, somehow derived from biological intelligence and you know until we do, run to a point where saying maybe we can do better than biology right <laughs> we are not there yet right human beings are still doing better okay. 
Okay, so that those are all the topics here. And uh, all right, I, sometimes I'm repeating myself here, but let's see, there might be some nugget here or there that uh, might be a value. All right, the convolution. Okay, this is about the convolution operation. This is uh, uh, something that uh, is well known in mathematics, particularly those who did signal processing type of thing, you know, the convolution operation very well. Um, so, uh, but there is uh, some differences here. You start with the mathematical operation and the way it is used ends up being quite different. So let's just look at convolution. There are all kinds of ways of defining it. I know, uh, one uh, definition of, uh, this is a one dimensional convolution is being talked about. And it was a kind of a, an example which had about uh, tracking location of a spaceship by a laser sensor. And the laser sensor provides a single output X of T, the, the position of the spaceship at, uh, the sensor it is providing a position of the spaceship at time T as X of T. And uh, W is a function of real world augment. If laser sensor is noisy, we want a weighted average that gives more weight to recent observation. So uh, weighting function is WA, where A is the age of the measurement. So it says you might have so many measurements from earlier points of time, and you want to give more importance to the current uh, reading than the older reading. So that's another function. So convolution is the weighted average or smooth estimate position of the spaceship. And this function is defined like this, S of T is, is uh, an integral of X of A, and this is age here, W of T minus A. So this kind of a function allows you to look at that signal and say, where is the spaceship? So you take into account uh, the positions given, and then there's a certain weighting each of these gives, it's a noise involved. So how do you combine all of these convolution? It's a little complicated way of defining it. So there is an interesting way. But uh, another way to look at convolution of two functions, f of u and g of u, is you have f of u is this big hump here, g of u, x minus u comes into play. And those two are now being convoluted together. It's not just a straightforward product of these things. And when you write s of t equal to c, you can sometimes say it is s of t is the convolution of x and w. And uh, w needs to be, we are talking about convolution of a, of a, of a uh, probability density function. So the first function x is referred to as the input, the second function w is referred to as the kernel, and the output uh, is referred to as feature map. So this comes from standard classical convolution terminology. We already got a sense of what convolution does, moving the thing over, but this is uh, from the fundamental mathematical principles. And it gets a little, uh, little involved, but uh, so what is happening when you convolve two things? Uh, I think I found this one in Wikipedia. This is a Wikipedia entry of what is convolution. So you have an F here, you have a G here, and you want to convolve F with G, and this involves flipping the G and moving it from left to right, and each time uh, multiplying the corresponding values, and then uh, you end up with G uh, convolution, uh, F convolution G and G. the same actually, it turns out to have this form with the, with the step function and the uh, triangular function, you're getting something smoothed out like that. So, and also shows you uh, how you uh, all the two things. Here is an F of T, G of T. So to show what happens uh, when you convolve F with G, if you have F and then you got to have flipped this G the other way around, and then you got to add a time offset to it, and uh, then only you go about uh, multiplying the two. So anyway, mathematically, that, that's, what, that's what goes on. It's a little bit involved, but it's a very powerful operation. People have known for a very, very long time that convolution is useful for image processing, taking one image, converting it to another image to do, for example, uh, edge detection or blurring in these kinds of operations. So. Anyway, it's absolutely not essential uh, to know all about convolution, to learn about convolutional um, neural networks, but convolution can be used with discrete variables also. That was all stated in terms of continuous variables and integrals. Well, what about, uh, uh, here is a f of t, which is just a sequence of values here over 
different points of time. Now convolution is defined as a summation in this way, a similar way here. And then you would have uh, a G function T minus tau. So that is, uh, this is the convolution kernel here that's being passed uh, over the other one. And uh, so we are showing here the uh, computation of a 1D discrete convolution. So for the parameters of the convolution involves a kernel size F, a padding P and a stride S. So these are the three parameters that come into play. If stride S equal to one, stride S equal to two is being illustrated. And for a kernel of this form, uh, that's being specified and this shows what happens when you pass the kernel over these values and uh, and you're uh, moving by one or two I suppose from stride one to stride two and there is a, a padding that is being put here <coughs> for instance there's zero padding here <coughs> there's a zero padding here zero padding here zero padding here so that uh, we are not operating with only two at a time here all these three so on. So these are some of the parameters that come into play. So that's the 1D convolution. And uh, so this kind of gives you now a sense for uh, how do you select this kernel, right? And uh, this is a convolution over more than one axis. For a 2D image, convolution is defined discrete convolution like that. And uh, sharply picked kernel uh, K for edge detection. Here is an input image. This is, I think, a Roman aqueduct here, I, and this kernel uh, looks like this, and uh, it's a very um, poorly illuminated one. It just gives you the edges in this image. And uh, so here are kernels K1 through K4 for line detection. This is what a kernel looks like for horizontal lines, for vertical lines, for 45 degree lines, and 115 degree lines, and so on. So these are all uh, image processing guys have, have figured out what these kinds of kernels ought to be to take an image like this, a grayscale image, and to give us a just an edge image, the kind of thing that the human eye or the biological eye seems to be doing. And there are some mathematics. So there is some some of these uh, some of these results you get from convolution, and then uh, there's also mathematical operation that it is a commutative operation. Uh, so we can uh, we can equal a convolution is commutative. We can write it uh, uh, from one to the other, uh, first and second. You can flip the two, so on. And uh, one version of convolution is called cross correlation. Image processing guys know this well. Cross cor correlation um, and uh, about flipping or not flipping. And we saw this image about uh, multiplication. And uh, some more of this uh, convolution viewed as matrix multiplication. So um, uh, this shows a little bit about the uh, the kind of uh, it's as if you are multi multiplying it. So what is the matrix you are multiplying by? If you just decide to use a convolution, so it should be equivalent to some other matrix you are multiplying by, and that happens to be this, uh, where you have. Uh, values repeated here a naught a minus one a minus two a minus n minus one some set of numbering scheme here and the same values get repeated across here a one a naught minus one and so on so these values i guess the a naughts are going along here and then a ones are going along a twos a minus one a minus one, those are the diagonal elements so that is what it's equivalent to, which means a lot of these values are the same what is the advantage of that from the machine learning point of view would be after all we're going to be figuring out what these weights are during the training phase forward propagation backward propagation and then we're saying ah you're going to be learning all of these values over here and all of these values over here are all the same so your shared parameters fewer parameters to deal with so that is one more thing you can think of as uh, why do we do uh, convolution is uh, neuroscientific basis mathematically for doing forward propagation but even for the learning part backward propagation uh, you are learning fewer parameters because it's a repeated or shared set of parameters so this is all what makes uh, this whole idea um, so strong that it has uh, remained with us all right okay
So let's do a little bit more on convolution. Okay, one more thing called motivation. What more motivation we want? We had a lot of motivation already. Let's see if there is anything more to say. Uh, It's a lot to say about this topic. So, Yann Lekun uh, won the Turing Award for this. Turing Award with, with two other people this year, last year, 2019 Turing Award was for uh, CNN, Convolution Leader. That was his contribution. So, what was so amazing about it is uh, all these things we're just talking about in terms of computational efficiency, neuroscientific basis, and uh, for learning and so on. So it has had a tremendous influence, all right? Yeah, I think I have some repetitions here about uh, convolution, sparse connect. Okay, I don't have much here. I need to kind of parameter sharing, um, no parameter sharing works and so on, all right? I don't think there's uh, much in that. I need to kind of reduce my slides on that topic. You know, I've done these slides over many, many years, many decades actually. So sometimes there's a bit of repetition here, pooling. All right, pooling is a very, very simple idea. Um, so it's just a subsampling step. So we have an input here, which is, let's say, after you have done convolution, you've got this, and you apply a, a max pooling with two by two filters in sprite two. So we are going through uh, a two by two filter, moving it along here, and we're taking for each square, what is the maximum value, six the maximum, eight is the maximum, and uh, three is the maximum, and four is the maximum. So this is called max pool. So simply saying, take a max, and then you move along. And, uh, and so we, we are, so this is the idea of max pool. <laughs> I was talking to my friend, uh, Rama Chalapa at the University of Mary, and uh, they, uh, uh, the book, uh, this is the, when the book had just come out, which was uh, the um, Goodfellow Bengio book on deep learning. And uh, I was just looking through, flipping through the references to the different pieces of work. And uh, for max pooling, there was a reference number. I said, who first uh, came up with this idea of simply replacing by the largest value? Uh, that's one way of, of uh, pooling the values. And it referred to a, a paper by a, Rama Chalapa and his uh, student, and uh, that they wrote a paper, you know, I don't know, a few years ago. Said we, that's what we did. We just replaced uh, every few values by the max value. That was our operation. And I said, uh, congratulations, you are the inventor of max pooling. He said, I never knew that was going to be such a significant point uh, finding a, a reference in a deep learning book. It's just my student thought of this idea of just. Uh, reducing the, the size of the image by replacing it by, by the maximum value. But that's become a very standard thing now. Sometimes you, you do inventions by, by luck or whatever, serendipity. So max pooling has become a standard operation. And even they did not realize that uh, it was going to be a, you know, longstanding as, as a way of, uh, uh, of processing images and so on using the max pool. Seems to be the most popular one. So he said after he saw that, uh, that the book referred to his uh, his paper. He says whenever one of his students uh, graduate with a PhD, he gives them a copy of that book, saying, <laughs> "This is the book which has got a mention of our work in deep learning, which is a single contribution of uh, but finding the maximum value and putting it in there." That was, that was an interesting conversation I had a few months ago with him. But anyway, the pooling stage in a convolution neural network. And there is usually the standard thing of input to layer, a convolution stage called an affine transform, you're multiplying by these values. And then um, detector stage, nonlinearity. So you do that. This is the, the ReLU part of it here. And there's a pooling stage. So this whole thing, convolution, detection, and then the pooling is referred to as a convolutional layer. All three together, it comes as a package, is convolution layer, convolutional layer, and so on. Uh, uh, the pooling layer uh, in Keras, again, you can choose that. 
using uh, max, for example, max pooling 1D. This is max pooling 2D with a stride and size and so on, padding and so on. So these are all some of the parameters you need to get familiar with to use pooling. Um, apparently, both terminologies are used in a typical CNN layer. Here we are showing this whole thing is a convolutional layer, all these three element stages together. Here they are being broken up separately and saying convolutional layer, detection layer, pooling layer. So they're saying uh, in the literature on convolutional neural networks, sometimes you simply say it's a convolutional layer or sometimes you break it up. Net is viewed as a larger number of simple layers in this case, simple layers, where a net is viewed as a small number of complex layers each having uh, many stages in it. All right. Okay, so then the question is, why is pooling performed? One is uh, dimensionality reduction, your downsampling. All right, so you're going from something shown here uh, as uh, a large tensor here. We're pooling it together to coming uh, to reducing the size of the image and uh, this is more than uh, three some 64 corresponding to maybe different kernels all right oh yeah what is the thing we are talking about that invariance to transformation so it is not just dimensionality reduction lots of elements going to a smaller number of elements smaller number of elements there is another uh, motivation uh, which is uh, not purely biological, but some kind of uh, invariance you can achieve. So uh, these are the kinds of uh, standard what are called affine transforms. Translation is just moving the object within the plane. Rotation is uh, turning an object uh, in the plane. And then uh, enlargement, you're kind of making it larger here. And then uh, reflection uh, across a particular mirror here is another kind of transformation. And uh, so this says uh, pooling seems to be good for invariance to transformations. The pooling function replaces the output unit uh, with a summary static statistic of uh, nearby inputs. And uh, max pooling reports the maximum output. So there are other methods, average of a rectangular neighborhood, L2 norm of a rectangular neighborhood. Weighted average based on central pixel. So you have all of these variants. And it says pooling causes translation invariance. Huh. So just like just by replacing it this value, it's uh, not just a mechanical uh, uh, you know reduction in the number of data points, but actually helps in some trans there are some uh, transformations. And why does that happen? Well. Um, I think this diagram tries to show that uh, max pooling. Uh, so this try to show why does pooling uh, uh, introducing invariance to translation, and uh, this says view of the uh, middle uh, of output of a convolutional layer. So we have outputs of nonlinearity, outputs of max pooling here, and then uh, this one has a detected stage. Uh, and uh, you have uh, the pooling stage here. Every input value has changed, uh, but uh, so we have changed it. Let's say we change that input value, and all we did here was uh, move that set of elements to the right, I think, right? 0 0.3, 0 0.1, 1.0. So, so we have just moved it by one pixel, and uh, at the output, uh, if you look at, uh, so we can we can say uh, every element of value has changed, but only half the values of the output have changed. And these have remained the same, one that has become one, and it has become 0.3 of uh, change, are only sensitive to the, yeah, this is because uh, uh, max pooling units are only sensitive to maximum values in the neighborhood, but not the exact value. It gives you a bit of intuition. Why does uh, a, a Pooling, such a simple operation, have uh, such a tremendous uh, influence, such as invariance to all kinds of things in the in the image. So, uh, why is translation invariance important? That was a translation. We just moved it by one pixel. The image got moved 
to the right by one pixel. It's important if you care about whether a feature is present rather than exactly where it is, right? For detecting a face, we just need to know that an eye is present in a region, not its exact location if you're trying to do face. And in other contexts, uh, it is uh, important to preserve location of the feature. To determine a corner, we need to know whether two edges are present and so on. So there are other situations where location may be important. Yeah. And then learning other invariances. So uh, pooling over spatial regions produces invariance to translation. But if we pool over the results of separately parameterized convolution, the features can learn which transformations to become invariant to. This is a kind of a powerful uh, thing uh, that we are talking about. The people have struggled earlier on how to make a pattern recognition system invariant to transformations of the input. I just uh, rotate it a little bit and so on and struggled with what kind of features should I use that are invariant to the operation. And deep learning offers a, an answer to all of this. Uh, let's see if you can understand this example. Uh, a pooling unit that uh, pools or multiple features that are learned with separate parameters can learn to be invariant to transformations of the input. So we have uh, we have this five large response to detector unit one here, and large response in pooling unit. So we have uh, we have uh, in this case. Uh, Two or two, uh, two different. <laughs> they look pretty much the same, right? Yeah. Uh, oh God, no! This image has been changed over here. This image has been changed. So this is again saying that uh, a pooling unit that pools over multiple features that are learned with separate um, set of parameters. Um, right. Example to see uh, why uh, a. Uh, a, 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 a having Multiple set of features um, creates invariance. This is another kind of okay. The motivation for this was um, is uh, using fewer pooling units and detector units. All right. Anyway, that's a that's an interesting example. Take a look at it. Pooling with downsampling. Okay, simply uh, uh, pool with uh, a small number. And so what is the theoretical guidance here? Which kind of pooling uh, one should use in different situations? And it is uh, possible to dynamically features together. So, uh, so this says by running a clustering algorithm on locations of interesting features, you use a different set of pooling regions for each image. Architectures, the, each of them gives you another layer. That 64 layers or something could, could correspond to different types of um, pooling you have done. And pooling can complicate our architecture that use uh, top-down information and uh, in certain certain areas. So there's always a caveat in all of these saying, you know, can you run into trouble doing this? CNN, so, that, so let's see, what are these things here? Real networks are branching structures. And we have CNN that processes a uh, fixed size, processed variable size images. Uh, does not have fully connected layer. What's happening is input image, output of convolution, and uh, output of pooling, strike four. All these three look the same here, right? And then we have uh, output of convolution plus the same. pooling with stride four, output of pooling to three by three grid, it's stride four, and then output of to reshape vectors, reshape vectors. Matrix multiplication, matrix multiplication, output of average pooling, output of softmax, output of softmax, output of softmax. So these are examples of architectures of classification of CNNs. Um, real networks are branching structures. Do we, do we put all this together or what? Hmm. So there are architectures that seem to put these things together. They're trying to do something. What is this object here? And they're saying that the car or a truck or an airplane, a ship or a horse. And so they have uh, all these convolutional layers and ReLU layers and the pooling layers going on here. And uh, that's a FC stands for fully connected layer. And uh, how uh, initial uh, 
towards the raw image of the pixel last while you show us the class course and uh, since it's a uh, volume so there okay i think it explains what's going on 32 by 32 by 3 for the raw pixel values measure width 32 height 32 three color characteristics convolution layer computes the output of neurons connected to regions and uh, we are doing some dot products here the volume such as 32 by 32 by 12 if you use the 12 filters that are being used here 12 filters refers to the different kernel functions that we are using different kernel functions are being being brought into play here And the pooling layer performs a downsampling operation. Anyway, so it's an engineering feat to put all these ideas together. And a particularly famous one, a lot of students seem to say, I am using VGGNet to solve my problem. This seems to be a popular one. Uh, the convolutional neural network model, very deep convolutional networks, and the model achieves 93% uh, in top five tests in ImageNet, which is a data set of over 14 million images belonging to thousand classes so this is a proved architecture available widely and uh, what is that architecture here seems to be a combination of convolution max pooling fully connected softmax so this is a kind of design right that seems to work well ah all of it in keras all right Okay, this slide, I think, goes along with the next topic, which I want to cover on Monday, which is this topic of capsule networks. Capsule networks, again, uh, Hinton was uh, very interested in this topic of invariance. Uh, how, when you go from one layer to the next layer, you should not lose as much information as a standard convolutional neuron does. How to preserve some of the original relationships that existed how do you do that using capsules okay i'm going to stop uh, right there um